I mean, karma. Am I right? Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Time. Crew Time. Crew Time. If you are new here, hello and welcome. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day. <laughs> and put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like fun to you, you're in the right place. Make sure you subscribe to this channel, hit the bell notification, and then that way you will never miss one of my terrible stories. If that sounds weird to you, what are you doing here? <laughs> Give it a try, you might like it. It's the first day of fall, you guys, so I'm doing fall makeup. But if you wanna know what I'm using, you're gonna have to look down in the description box. Everything's linked, but I don't really talk about it. <laughs> this isn't gonna air on the first day of fall, but I'm recording this on the first day of fall. Whatever. Today's story was recommended by a lovely viewer named Sarah Senorchia. Am I saying that right? Pro I'm sorry, Sarah. Either way, I appreciate you. And this case is a doozy and I'd never heard of it before, which is surprising because it's fairly recent. So this is the story of Marcus Karma. In the wee wee morning hours of April 27th, 2014, like just after midnight, the Grant Creek neighborhood of Missoula, Montana was awoken by the sound of gunshots. In a frantic 911 call, Janelle Flager told the dispatcher that her husband had shot and gravely injured a robber. She didn't say intruder, you know, keep that in the back of your mind while I tell the story. She said robber. Missoula County first responders and police were dispatched to the 2400 block of Deer Canyon Court. When the responders arrived around 1230, they found one of the homeowners, Janelle's husband, and 29-year-old firefighter, Marcus Karma, in the driveway with his shotgun. Inside the garage, lying on the floor, was a teenage boy, gravely injured, having suffered several gunshot wounds. He was quickly rushed into the ambulance and then off to the hospital. Unfortunately, this teenager didn't survive. He was gone within like 30 minutes, but he was identified as 17-year-old Deeran Dayday. What happened in this garage? Who was Deeran Dayday? I'm glad you asked. Deren Dede was a 17-year-old exchange student from Hamburg, Germany that was studying at Big Sky High School in Missoula, Montana. Side note, that's the best name ever for a high school. Big Sky High? Come on. Sounds like a cartoon. Deren was actually born in Turkey, but he and his two sisters were being raised in a working class section of Hamburg. His mother, Golsin, worked in a coffee shop and his father, Salal, was a cab driver. So Deren was living in Missoula, Montana with his host family, Kate Walker and Randy Smith. Deren, actually, he had arrived the previous August and that arrangement was supposed to be temporary until his permanent home became available. But Kate and Randy bonded with Deren and asked him to stay. Kate described Deren as a very special kid, happy, bright eyes, full of life. His friends described him as outgoing and friendly and charismatic and very athletic. He played soccer, he ran track, and did other sports at Big Sky during his junior year in the United States. He was a great student, you know, he was actively interested in world events like politics and history. He wasn't just, you know, doom scrolling TikTok and playing video games. Don't get me wrong. He was a 17 year old kid. He was maybe a little more mature, I guess you could say. Like based on everything I found, this kid was the bee's knees. And all the bee buddies are there, you are hanging out with the bees. Not only was he smart and athletic and cool and fun, he was handsome, definitely very smooth with the ladies. When I was 17 years old, boys did not look like this. I mean, come on. Anyway, so Deren's BFF was another exchange student and a soccer teammate. His name was Robbie Pazmino. He was from Ecuador. And Robbie and Deren were a package deal. You know, if you saw one, the other one would appear shortly. So by late April of 2014, I guess this isn't recent. What am I thinking? This is like nine years ago. Wow. By late April of 2014, Deren's junior year at Big Sky High was wrapping up. He was due to return to Germany in just a few short weeks. But on the night of Saturday, April 26th, Darren and Robbie were playing video games and listening to music in the basement of Darren's host family home. Darren's host dad, Randy, came downstairs around 10.30 p.m. That night, told him maybe crank the music volume down a little bit. Then he and his wife, Kate, went to bed. 10.30, Saturday night. Sounds like me. <laughs> 
Anyways, Robbie would later say that just before midnight, Darren said that he was bored and wanted to go for a walk. Well, Robbie was tired and wanted to stay in, so he tried to talk Darren out of it, but eventually went along. The boys were just kind of wandering around the neighborhood, walking down the street, and they noticed a garage door that was open. Well, Darren approached and Robbie waited at the bottom of the driveway in the street. A moment later, Robbie heard the angry yell of like a man and then three gunshots and then a fourth. Robbie took off running back to Deeran's host family home, jumping over a couple of fences and losing his cell phone in the process. Deeran's host dad, Randy, actually heard the gunshots. Uh, they woke him up from his sleep, so he went downstairs to make sure that the boys were okay. And when he got down there, he only found Robbie. At first, Robbie was afraid to tell the truth. You know, he said he didn't know where Deeran was and Randy was kind of like checking around the house. And then Robbie confessed about their garage encounter and getting kind of busted. So Randy went upstairs to wake up Kate and then the three of them went out into the night to look for Deeran. So the house with the garage incident was really only one street over. It was a very short walk. So they headed over there and on their way, they passed an ambulance, but they had no idea that Deeran was inside of it. When they got to the house where the police cars were, Randy approached and gave the officer the name and description of Deeran. And the officers told him to go to the hospital but it didn't look good. By the time Randy and Kate got to the hospital, Darren had already succumbed to his wounds. He had been shot in the back of his left arm and in his head. So WTF happened. Investigators quickly learned about an activity that was popular with the local teens called garage hopping. So Robbie and the other students at Big Sky High described garage hopping as going out at night to look for open garage doors in the neighborhood and you would go inside and raid the refrigerator for beers. It might not be common everywhere, but in most of the United States, especially in the suburbs, it's super common to uh, have like a second refrigerator in the garage that's just for drinks or beer or like extra leftovers. Typically it's like the fridge that got replaced in the kitchen. You know what I'm saying? So these kids in their garage hopping, I mean, they're breaking and entering, okay? But also this is Montana. And I know what you're thinking, okay, if somebody busts up into your garage uh, in Brooklyn, okay, it's not like a light and silly vibe. But in that area at the time, it was pretty innocent, no harm meant, you know, I'm not saying that it's something smart to do, but it's not something that anybody ever thought that they were going to get killed over in Montana. And I am going to put my eyebrows on and I'll be right back. Okay, okay. Where was I? Where was I? The investigators also learned that Marcus Karma and Janelle Flager, the homeowners in this story, had recently been the victims of petty theft. You know, twice in the past three weeks, they said that things had been taken out of their cars, including cash, credit cards, and a cell phone. They had reported these thefts to the police, but they had, you know, zero confidence that anything would be done. And we know this because Marcus said it in his interview with police right after the shooting. Oh yeah, Marcus went right into an interview with um, police detectives after shooting someone. No attorney. It's just so stupid. This is what do we call self-snitching. Here's a little advice from me to you. If your actions caused the death of another person, even if you felt it was justified, get a lawyer, okay? Moving on. So Marcus told investigators that they knew the police wouldn't or couldn't do anything. So he said that they felt like they were constantly on edge and that on that evening, they felt scared. And you know, the scary part about this is I think Janelle and I both share this feeling, but we feel like we're being watched. He was getting ready to have to travel out of town for work, leaving Janelle at home alone with their infant son. Either we, you know, accept that we're being watched and gonna continue to be burglarized or we put a stop to it. If we're gonna do that, you know, we have to be a little proactive. He explained that Janelle had also placed like a baby monitor, a video baby monitor in the garage um, on one of the inside walls to try to catch the burglars if they ever came back. They also had motion sensors in their driveway uh, leading up into the garage and they would provide a notification of any kind of movement, you know, apps like Ring or whatever it was in 2014. Those existed back then, right? Yeah. Well, on the evening of April 26th, Marcus and Janelle had been watching a movie after they put their son to bed. About halfway through the movie, they paused to take a smoke break 
in their garage. He said that they left their garage door open to air it out afterwards. Now that's a little weird. You know, for somebody that's fearful of break-ins, why would they leave the door open? I'm just saying. What was revealed later was that five days before the shooting, Janelle had actually emailed their neighbors about the break-ins and things being taken from inside their cars, inside the garage. She advised in this email that all the neighbors lock up their vehicles, houses, and please close their garage doors at night to, you know, reduce the risk. So Mr. and Mrs. Neighborhood Watch left their door open and went back inside. So a bit later, they're watching the movie and the motion detectors on the driveway went off and then the video baby monitor turned on in the garage and both of those alerts came to their cell phones. So essentially they are now sitting on the couch watching on their phones someone in their garage. Well, Marcus claims that he was terrified, but he also claims that he kind of took his time getting off the couch to address the issue and to grab his loaded shotgun. Then Janelle said to Marcus, it's showtime. I'm sorry, what? That's a funny thing for people that are terrified to say. Moving on. So Marcus grabbed his shotgun and walked out the front door. Now the garage um, actually had two doors with a small divider in the middle and the door that was partially open, like mostly open, was the one on the left side as you're looking at it. And in the driveway, Marcus had backed his truck all the way up to the front of that door and the car inside was pulled as close to the door as possible. You could only maneuver in a very specific way. Oh, and also Janelle admitted that they left a purse of hers with valuables that they had cataloged inside the garage as bait. This couple had effectively set a trap. Okay, so Marcus walks out the front door, turned in front of the garage, and then started to fire his shotgun into it. He said that he shot up and to the right, and then he moved to the left as he fired one, two, three, and four. Now, he couldn't see a thing inside the garage because when he got outside, Janelle turned on the outside light, which sort of blinded him to anything that he'd be able to see inside the dark garage. But he did say that he heard the sound of like metal on metal, you know, a scraping noise, and that he imagined the next thing that was gonna happen was one of his tools, like an ax or like a heavy wrench was gonna come flying out of the garage and hurt him. It scared him so much that he he had to fire, he had to shoot. I mean, this burglar was essentially a caged animal. When those thoughts are going through your head about a caged animal trapped inside all the way out is through you, did you ever think at any of that moment, maybe I should just step back, give him that opportunity to just run out of my garage so I don't get hurt? No, I want them to get arrested. One second, okay, they could see on the baby monitor that it was one person. I mean, why not turn the lights on and catch the guy. If you're asking me if Marcus intended to truly capture this person and like hold them for police to come and arrest him, he had a shotgun. I mean, all you have to do is like, uh, turn on the light, announce your presence, and rack around. This is it, don't get scared now. The guy's not gonna go anywhere. Or, you know, call me crazy. They could have avoided all of it and just called 911. No, instead the terrified Marcus walked outside and confronted what he said was a deadly threat. And then he fired four rounds into his house where his infant was sleeping. Make it make sense. Okay, so everything that was explained by Marcus was also heard by the prosecutor and they arrested him that night. He was stunned. Okay, he completely believed that the actions that he took that night were totally justified. You know, a person entered his garage and he could shoot them. We'll come back to that, okay? We'll come back to that, don't worry. Well, after this event and Marcus's arrest, another thing that happened pretty quickly was his neighbors all came down to the police station to share their experience with their neighbor Marcus Karma. Apparently, he was known by neighbors as a hothead. He'd actually used his shotgun to threaten a landscaper who was, you know, hired to spray the yard. Another neighbor told news outlets that it was just a matter of time. So at any rate, Marcus Karma was charged with deliberate homicide in the death of Deer and Day Day. It's essentially the equivalent of first degree murder. So. 
The trial actually got started pretty quickly, only eight months after the event. It took place in December of that same year. The defense centered their case around the Castle Doctrine, which in simplest terms means that a person can protect their home and they can use deadly force to do it, and they're immune to any of the legal consequences that come from that deadly force. There's no decision-making process that can go on where we have to be right or wrong. It's we've got to protect. Castle Doctrine exists in every state in the United States and in some kind of variation in nine other countries, but the specific rules vary from state to state. In Montana, the use of force to defend an occupied structure is justified when and to the extent that the person reasonably believes that the force is necessary to prevent or terminate the other person's unlawful entry or attack on their home. In kind of plain language means it's a stand your ground state where it's actually legal to shoot someone just for entering your residence. And I'm talking, I mean perfectly legal. Did you know that? The major key to that is that the person being intruded upon doesn't have a duty to retreat or kind of avoid, you know, before they use the force. His heart feels like it's going to go through his chest. And it was a man who was fearful and he had to take a step that no one wants to take. So the defense outlined the failures of the Missoula Police Department that left Marcus to feel like he had to take matters into his own hands. This real fear that he was going through with home invasion, lack of police response, and the fact that he was going to be leaving in a couple weeks was a lot for this man to deal with, almost too much. They also asserted that the police should have treated Robbie Pasmino as a second suspect but they didn't even bother to try to locate him after he fled the scene. Which, okay, the math ain't mathin' because Robbie brought Deren's host family to the scene to find Deren that night. So I am confusion. The defense also claimed that a burglary ring was running rampant in the neighborhood. They said that on April 19th, 2014, Marcus and Janelle's home had been burglarized when somebody entered through their unlocked garage and then someone stole a wallet and iPhone from their unlocked vehicle and they also stole marijuana and a bong. Now, a little interesting side note nugget that isn't super relevant, but whatever. Anyways, um, in 2014, possession of marijuana in the state of Montana, illegal. Well, well, well. How the turntables. And Marcus Karma did not have some kind of medical use card or whatever. But does that make him a bad person? No. But was he maybe extra mad? that somebody busted up in his garage and took weed that he wasn't even supposed to have? The state argued there was nothing in the garage worth stealing, saying this was just a case of karma defending his pride. So the defense didn't really call that many witnesses to testify, but their most important one was Marcus's wife, Janelle. She testified that they were afraid of these druggies breaking in and harming their infant son. When asked about the marijuana use, she said that she and Marcus would sometimes smoke in the garage and they would leave the door open to air it out. I guess only other people are druggies? Okay. Anyway, she actually testified to the evening's events um, a little differently. She said that she had got up alone to smoke in the garage and left the garage door open, thinking that Marcus was right behind her to do the same thing, and then he would close it after. When she was questioned, why would somebody that was so concerned about the safety of their baby in the wake of repeated burglaries leave any doors open? She said that, you know, it was a miscommunication between her and Marcus, and she had the right to leave her door open if she wanted to. Well, the prosecution dug right into these contradictions and hypocrisies, and in particular, telling the neighbors to close their garages for safety, but then they left theirs open, and they left a purse intentionally as bait. Then they brought up the 911 call and her interviews with police from that night. In an audio recording of one of those interviews, you can hear Janelle clearly say, and then I heard the kid yelling, no, 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 please. So even after that audio of the call was played in the courtroom, when she was asked about it on the witness stand, she said that she didn't remember hearing Deren Dede say anything that night. I don't know what I said. Yeah, Janelle's testimony, not super helpful for the defense. The state's case centered around Marcus Karma as an angry vigilante. The bait that was left out and the setup of the doors and the way the cars were parked created an intentional trap. He did this on purpose. Please tell the defendant that while we live in a state with a strong gun culture, 
It is not one of lawlessness or vigilante justice. Please tell the defendant and Mr. and Mrs. Day Day that Darren's life meant more than a couple cans of beer. Robin Rinquist, a neighbor and friend of Janelle's, testified that Janelle told her, quote, Oh yeah, he's coming back because we're going to bait him. I mean, she said that this was odd because you wouldn't want someone to come back to your house. It would be scary. A local hairdresser testified that just two days before this shooting, this murder, she had cut Marcus's hair. And while he was sitting in the chair, he said that he'd been sitting up for three nights waiting to kill some kids. He also said, I'm not kidding. You'll seriously see this on the news. Proactive. She said that Marcus was being extremely vulgar and belligerent, so she asked him to, like, chill out on the swearing, and he said, I can say whatever the fuck I want. Charming. The prosecution played the jailhouse phone calls between Marcus and Janelle, because in the beginning, at least, she didn't have enough money to bail him out, and or I think the, maybe the judge denied bail. It doesn't matter. He was locked up. They spoke quite freely about the case and their feelings around it. You know, Marcus said, let's not forget he was committing a felony crime in our house and it doesn't matter if he was a 17-year-old kid, this was a felony. Was he considering taking something that didn't belong to him? Probably. Did he deserve to die for his transgressions? No. Okay, but does petty theft carry a death sentence? I'm gonna go with no. And you know what, you guys, feel free to roast me in the comments. I'd love to hear about it. Tell me, your, give me your feelings. Marcus also said about the case, quote, everyone should rejoice, fucking idiots. At one point, Janelle said that she actually wanted to move out of the neighborhood because she felt that the community was upset about this killing. And Marcus said to her, I wouldn't worry about it. They'll get over it. Just super nice people. Robbie Pasmino actually testified at the trial and he said that he and Deren were not familiar with, you know, this concept of garage hopping until they came to Montana. It was explained to them as like a sort of game. So you were aware if you committed a crime and you were caught, they could basically deport you and send you home, right? Yeah, but we didn't like, like, I think Deren never felt like it was a crime. That's my point. He never realized that there were like real consequences or that, you know, you could be shot if you went into someone's garage uninvited. They don't have castle doctrine laws in Germany or Ecuador. The defense's strategy about Deren being part of this known burglary ring and the police not doing a thing about it was also attacked by the state. The prosecution team not only located this burglary ring, burglary, burglary. I'm saying it weird. Sorry. They also found the actual kid who had taken the items from the Karma garage. Two separate things. That kid was not even part of this ring. And none of them had ever heard of Deren until after he was killed. By mid-December, the jury went into deliberations. And after eight hours, over two days, they returned a verdict. Guilty of deliberate homicide. The sentencing phase got started a couple months later in February of 2015. It included more testimony regarding the total lack of remorse and indignant behavior by both Marcus and Janelle. In one conversation on December 28th of 2014, he referred to himself as American hero for what he did. Janelle took the stand to apologize to Deer and Day Day's family. My heart breaks for your family and the pain that you all feel. And the prosecutor ripped her to shreds. You just told the judge, my heart breaks for your family and the pain you all are feeling. Is that Actually, I told uh, Mr. Day-Day. You told Mr. Day-Day that. I was portraying that to him, yes. Okay. And just a couple of days ago, you were actually on the phone with Marcus, right? I speak to him several times a day. Talking about reimbursing them for the funeral expenses for their son. Is that right? Sure. And you said, we are paying for them to ship their own dirty rat son back. I mean, shots fired. Before pronouncing the sentence, District Judge Ed McLean told the shackled Marcus Karma that he had acted like a hunter when he purposefully left that garage door open that night, not as a man 
who was protecting his family. Marcus Karma was sentenced to serve 70 years in prison, 20 of which must be completed before he can be eligible for parole. Marcus, of course, has appealed this conviction and he specifically has requested a new trial that was denied. He tried the higher courts and so far everything's been denied. After Darren Dayday's death in Missoula, Montana, local kids completely stopped garage hopping. The Day Day family also sued Marcus Karma and Janelle Flager. They did reach an out-of-court settlement and part of that demanded that all firearms in their possession be surrendered. I mean, Karma, am I right? And that is the story of Marcus Karma. Why is my shirt different, you ask? Because I forgot to record the outro to this video until now, and I've already changed my clothes. It's lucky I kept my face on. <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you wanna see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week, and you can follow me on all of the other socials as well. If you have a crew crime story that you would like to recommend to me, look down in the description box because there's a Google doc that you can complete and put in all the dirty details. I would love to hear from you. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye. This thing is, this thing is shredded. Synergia, 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 synergia. Like up and to the right. Is that the right direction? I don't really know what I'm doing <laughs> with this makeup. Up, no, yeah, up, up. I'm sweating. <laughs> Right? Up and to the right? So the prosh prosh the prosecution. Wait, as you're looking at this, it's gonna be. <laughs> what I do here is tell <laughs> is bang into my mirror. <laughs>